Welcome to our fourth annual Courageous Conversations Lecture. I'm Dr. Sybil Brownlee, Vice President for Student Affairs. The Courageous Conversation Series was initiated by students and continues to be led by our outstanding student leaders. I applaud all of the volunteers who worked with Third World Alliance to make tonight's lecture possible. At Worcester State University, we are proud that we offer engaging learning opportunities both inside and outside the classroom. Opportunities to hear from outstanding leaders such as Randall Robinson enrich our students' experience and expand all of our horizons. Our past Courageous Conversation speakers include noted authors Cornell West, Angela Davis, and Kwasi Mfume. Could I ask everyone on the planning committee and our sponsors who are listed in the program for tonight's event to stand? Please stand so we can acknowledge you. This group has established a celebrated event our greater community anticipates each year. It was the vision of this group and Third World Alliance to host Randall Robinson tonight as part of an ongoing commitment to facilitating open and reflective dialogue on race and equality. At the close of tonight's program, we are delighted to be hosting a book signing with Mr. Robinson. I now want to welcome to the podium a great friend of Worcester State University, Gladys Rodriguez Parker. From from Congressman Jim McGovern's office. She is a proud graduate of WSU and has always been there for us. Please join me in welcoming Gladys Rodriguez Parker, who will introduce our speaker. Good evening. Good evening. And buenas noches. Welcome, Dr. Robin. Um, this is a, this is indeed a wonderful, wonderful evening. I'm so delighted to be here. I applaud Worcester State University and its outstanding leaders for creating these powerful conversations, um, these powerful opportunities for dialogue. Um, you give me hope for the future. And um, I know that Congressman McGovern would have loved to have been here with us tonight, but his work in Washington on our behalf prevents that. But I get the honor of introducing tonight's speaker. Randall Robinson is the author of An Unbroken Agony, the national bestsellers The Debt, The Reckoning, and The Defending the Spirit. He is also the founder and past president of Trans Africa, the African American organization he established to promote enlightened constructive U.S. policies towards Africa and the Caribbean. In 1984, Robinson established the Free South Africa Movement, which pushed successfully for the imposition of sanctions against apartheid South Africa. And in 1994, his public advocacy, including a 27-day hunger strike, led to the UN multinational operation that restored Haiti's first democratically elected government to power. A law professor at Penn State University, he is a graduate of Harvard Law School. We won't hold that against him. Over 19 universities have bestowed upon him honorary PhDs in recognition of the international impact of his social justice advocacy. He is the recipient of numerous awards, and among the institutions that have honored him are the United Nations, the Congressional Black Caucus, Harvard University, Essence Magazine, ABC News Person of the Week, the Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolent Change, the NAACP, and Ebony Magazine Awards show. Robinson has shared his views and policy recommendations on Nightline, CNN, The Today Show, 
C-SPAN, The Travis Smiley Show, The Charlie Rose Show, and other leading American television programs. His life and his work are an inspiration to us all. Please join me in giving Randall Robinson a warm Wor Worcester, Massachusetts welcome. Saturday 
gives you a sense of how old I am. We paid our nine cents and went in. We went into the movie at any time. Nobody checked our movie schedule. We went into the movie and we sat down right in the middle of it. Didn't make any difference because we were going to see it nine times anyhow. <laughs> but you see, you can't do that anymore. And so you can't know what is going on in the story when you come in in the middle of the movie. And that is what we so often do on world crises as a democratic citizen. We think Egypt just happened. We think Tunisia just happened. We think Libya just happened. We don't seem to know that in the 19... <coughs> early 1920s. A British official named <coughs> Percy Cox sat in a tent and drew lines in the sand and created the nations that therefore did not exist. Saudi Arabia, and Iraq, and on and on and on. But history tells us that while its consequences are delayed, when we make mistakes, when we do things that we shouldn't do, we often have to pay for those mistakes much later in time. It means that for all of us, we have a responsibility to try to inform ourselves, which is something our society doesn't do very well. We ought to have multicultural education from kindergarten on so that we understand something about the world, a shrinking world, a world more interdependent, a world more dangerous and perilous than ever in our lifetimes. We ought to know something about the people who live in it who have problems that they believe we have <coughs> caused and we know nothing about. The comedian George Lopez, I saw him some time ago entertaining in San Antonio, Texas. He was entertaining a largely Spanish-speaking audience. I had assumed they were largely Mexican Americans. And he said not wholly in jest that when we comprise the majority, before, before the middle of the century, Spanish-speaking Americans, Latino Americans, Asian Americans, and African Americans will comprise the new American majority. It has already happened in California. And he said that when we come to power, we will treat them exactly as they have treated us. It was as ominous as he meant it. But we don't know how we have treated anybody. And so we can't understand that there could be a kind of residual anger. You see, we, we don't know that the virtual entirety of the southwestern United States used to be a part of Mexico. We don't know that Texas was Mexico. 
We don't know that we invaded all the way to Mexico City, but we didn't want to move beyond the Rio Grande largely because we took all of the territory we wanted, but we did not want the Mexicans. We don't know that Theodore Roosevelt, whose face is on Mount Rushmore, promised the Filipinos when they were fighting against Spain for their independence that we were on the side of the Philippines. And after that freedom was won, we moved in and colonized the Philippines. <coughs> with Teddy Roosevelt referring to Filipinos as Pacific Negroes. We don't know anything about these things. The Africans have a proverb. The axe forgets, but not the truth. It's a real telling problem. It means that we are obliged, for we are responsible for our public policy. We're in two wars now, one finishing, the other midway through the longest war in American history. We find ourselves with an all-volunteer army. All-volunteer because we wouldn't be able to waste the war where we drafted young men and women because it would create a political movement against it so large that it would be difficult and untenable to sustain. But we depend on poor, not terribly well-educated young people to meet the appeal of patriotism to go off and fight in Afghanistan. <laughs> Afghanistan is the second most corrupt government in the world. But again, as in Vietnam and in so many other places, we have embraced the side that's convenient to embrace at that particular time. We talked about Mubarak in Egypt, as if it were new to us, when we had been through rendition, sending prisoners to Mubarak to torture. We knew what he was doing. But it was all right until the Egyptian people blew up and overturned that tyranny. <coughs> but it was a tyranny made possible by us. At the end of World War II, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt together with his wife, led the effort to spearhead and establish the new United Nations in a meeting in San Francisco. Mrs. Roosevelt <coughs> led the effort to have passed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a milestone in human affairs. For the first time in human history, we would see individuals around the world invested with individual human rights. And in the train of what happened in San Francisco, the United Nations has passed 26 major human rights conventions. Conventions that protect the rights of men, women, and children the world over to protect them from the predatory impulses of their own governments. But the Convention for the Protection of the Rights of the Child has been ratified by every country in the world save two, Somalia and the United States of America. The Convention to 
to protect the rights of women <coughs> has been ratified by virtually every country in the world save a handful, including the United States of America. The International Criminal Court was established by a vote of 105 to a handful. That handful included states like Iraq, Iran, on and on and on, and the United States of America. We have done everything we can to destroy the International Criminal Court. Now, I talk about these things not to oddly criticize my country. As a matter of fact, one of the great responsibilities of democracy is to criticize. But the first responsibility is to know. And I know at the same time that many of the things that I talk about critically I'd be shocked for if I lived in many other countries. So in that respect, this is a great country. It allows us freedom to say what we wish to say. But it hasn't always allowed us knowledge, the things that we all need to know about. One of those things has to do with the nation of Haiti. Many of us get the impression that, that Haiti is a tragic state. Why do these things befall Haiti? Even, uh, uh, what's the man's name who's in so much trouble with drugs, two and a half men? <laughs> Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen is going to Haiti <laughs> it leaves you breathless. Inside the events, inside the abduction of President Aaron Street, on the phone with the house the night that he and his wife Mildred, a Haitian American, were abducted. Inside the plane where they were flown off by 30 American soldiers. Inside the plane when it landed near St. Kitts in Antigua to refuel. And the Antiguan officials were not allowed on the plane as customs officials routinely are supposed to be allowed. Inside, they're being taken to the Central African Republic and held there by President Bozizi at the behest of France. President George Bush. Maxine Waters and I had to charter a plane to fly to the Central African Republic to rescue the president, to fly him to Jamaica. Then we got Tabo and Becky in South Africa to grant them asylum. Now we have the United States obstructing their return to Haiti. One of the covenants that we are a part of is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. That covenant that we have signed and bound ourselves to comply requires that no state can forbid a citizen from leaving his or her country or from returning to his or her. So the United States is in direct violation of an international treaty 
we are bound by law to comply. Now, why did I tell you all this boring stuff? I tell you because ignorance will kill you. You know, it's, it's, it, you've got to know what is being done in our memory. <clears throat> and it's so hard. New York Times is all the news that's fit. Not the New York Times, nor ABC, nor NBC, nor CBS, nor CNN. Lord heaven forgive. Fox. <laughs> Not one of these news organizations has said anything other than the president fled it. Fled to South Africa. No mention of the Central African Republic. We got there and spoke to President Bozizi. Said we are leaving. 12 o'clock midnight, wheels up, and we want the President and Mrs. Aristide on this plane. And he said, first I must call Washington, and then I must call Paris. If I get permission, he will be allowed to leave. Then we flew them to Geneva. And then Condoleezza Rice threatened P.J. Patterson's Jamaican government, threatened that we would destroy Jamaican tourism if they continued to keep President Aristide in Jamaica. Now, I say these things to, the, to you because things that are done in our name, things in a democracy for which we all are responsible, What you don't know will kill you. Every year we have Black History Month. Dick Gregory said that they even gave us the month with some of the days missing. <laughs> <laughs> teachers uh, who uh, uh, Creolo, um, Raya, for instance, who, who uh, the pedagogy of the oppressed wrote about the banking concept of teaching. I have the information I deposited in your head and you ask me no questions. Uh, forgetting that education is a dialogical process. I learn as much from you as you learn from me. Education is a blessing, it's fun, it's as great as the basketball suit I used to run up and down the court with. But that's the way we're supposed to learn. So, how do, how do we do this? How do we get outside ourselves and find out information about which we know so little? In 1804, Toussaint Louverture and Jean Jacques Dessalines, <coughs> with a group of free slaves in the Haiti, 40,000 of them, defeated Spain, defeated England, defeated France once, defeated Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, and France again, and sent France off packing done with colonialism, made him sell the entire Midwest to the United States for a small fee, all of which was created by Haiti. Haiti that then 
opened its doors to any slave, free slavery anywhere in the New World. Gave guns to Simone Bolivar, a printing press. Gave them a place to live in Haiti when fleeing while fighting for the independence of Latin America from Spain. I went to a high school in Jamaica and spoke recently, Jamaica is just a stone's throw from Haiti. And I said to the high school students in Jamaica, how many of you have ever heard of Toussaint Louverture? Not one of them raised their hand. And then I said, how many of you have ever heard of Snoop Dogg? <laughs> Every hand went up. Do you think it is just happenstance that makes Snoop Dogg famous when you know nothing about one of the towering figures of hemispheric history, a man whose, whose work and deeds and feats should be a household <coughs> work in every home in this country. A man who was, was, was said by Thomas Jefferson that we must bring him low no matter what we do, we must destroy him. George Washington said the same. They said it because with what he has done with freed slaves in Haiti has given impulse as I look through the window at slaves we have here, has given impulse to them. This thing can spread, you see, like a terrible, illness that will kill us all. And so when we do Black History Month, we think we're talking about Black history. <coughs> we think we're talking about a people whose very existence started in slavery and proceeded until today. As a boy, we were called Negroes. It was fine with me. I was stupid. It was an involuntary stupidity. As someone once told me, there's no such thing as a sardine that swims in the ocean. Sardine only becomes a sardine when it is killed and put in a can. So this term Negro was invented for Africans to separate them from memory and culture. There is no worse thing you can do to a people than to strip them of their memory of themselves. So I remember when I was a little boy, my mother in Richmond, Virginia, we used to have this saying, people used to say, from here to Timbuktu. And I said, where is Timbuktu? What is Timbuktu? Is there a Timbuktu? And then we used to hear all of this about the queen of sheep. Where is this queen? And what is she? Nobody seemed to know. Timbuktu was the venue of Sankora University in ancient Mali. In the year 1403, they performed cataract surgery at Timbuktu. There are two libraries there now with hundreds 
of thousands of African literatures, novels, poetry, and letters moldering in these libraries. Sankora University is established years before the Moors invaded Spain and established the first university in Europe at Salamanca. When I was a child, you see, and we were being destroyed psychically, when we were being told that we had no history, that were, we were inferior because we had accomplished nothing. This was stuff I needed to know. But I was denied, and it was not an accident. And it is an ongoing crime. <clears throat> the only information we get in America on a broad basis, information that is devoid of politics or recent event, is information we get about Western Europe and about ourselves. And so we can't understand Libya because we don't know anything about it. We couldn't understand Iraq, we couldn't understand Vietnam. We can't understand beings because we don't know anything about the rest of the world. We don't know their languages, we don't know their religions, we don't know beings. In my human rights class, I read some selections from a sacred text. And the selections all talk very disparagingly about women. How they must be kept, and how they must be beaten, and how they must be disallowed to do this and disallowed to do that. And I asked my students, where do you think these selections come from? They all thought they came from the Koran. They all came from the Bible. But we don't understand the relationship of the three great Abrahamic religions and how similar they were and are. And thus, we have been taught not to have a great regard for Islam, the fastest growing religion in the world. And so it seems to me that if we're going to have the kind of <coughs> model of democratic society for the world that we want to have, we're going to have to start requiring our students to learn something about the world early in their education lives, long before they get to college. And I tell young people all the time that you know, many of you, when you study for your exams, you will study and study and cram and cram and sit up all night and take the exam and then forget everything you learn. <laughs> Some of you, poor soul, will forget before you take the exam. <laughs> <laughs> but you never forget what you learned in chapter. And so if you want to know something about the world, you want to grow from contact with other cultures, if you want to broaden yourselves, you need to get out of Worcester, Massachusetts. You need to travel somewhere, go to other countries, speak other languages, meet other peoples, understand that there is a greater poverty than material. That there are people who have so much less, who are so much richer. There are people who are so much richer, who have nothing. That perhaps we have been led to worship the wrong God. The God of stuff, of which we have so much. You know, I am. I'm going to end my comment with a story that just happened 
recently, it's a small story, and I won't identify the country or the person, but it is someone I know. It is a domestic worker I know in the Caribbean. And her daughter is living on a military base somewhere in the world where her husband serves in the American Army. He just had a baby. She wanted her mother, as is the tradition, to come and help her. Because her husband had been sent off, sent off on duty for six months, and she was there in a foreign country alone. And so her mother managed to cobble together $700, at which she cannot afford. Travel to Barbados, which is where you have to go, to apply for a visa an American visa to get into the American military base in a foreign country. And when she got there, she was turned down. He didn't explain to her why. She is a good person, no criminal record, God-fearing, decent to a fault. And so she had to fly home to her island with nothing. Americans can come to any Caribbean country with nothing more than a driver's license. You don't have to have a visa. You don't have to have anything. Just walk into the country. Caribbeans to come here have to fly a long way to another country to even apply for a visa that they might not get. Then they have to present at the embassy, a bank statement showing how much money they have to get in to the United States. This is the kind of small, <coughs> accreting insult that we meet out to peoples around the world. And then we wonder that they don't like us. And sometimes we even estimate that they don't like us because they are jealous of us. <laughs> Everybody has to take responsibility. Everybody has to explain to everybody we can't manage the understand, misunderstanding in the Middle East unless we have credibility to manage misunderstanding. I'm afraid we have compromised. <coughs> I'm afraid President Obama has been a media disappointment in this area. I'm afraid that we become captive of certain forces before we can be president, so that once we become president, we don't have very much space in which to operate. Yeah. Ours has become a very mean political society. Yeah. Our news now has been corporatized. Yeah. Rupert Murdoch owns Fox. Rupert Murdoch owns the Wall Street Journal. Rupert Murdoch owns much of your learning source. He has his own political objectives to accomplish. Too many of us read things and we think we see it on the page and it is true. You shouldn't even do that with your textbooks. All of these things come out of the minds and hearts of the people who write them. Question everything. I never thought I would quote. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they trust but verify. Always, always verify. You have a responsibility, not just to vote, but to know for what 